guys! How's it going? It's good to see you guys again. Gosh, it's been too long! How was everybody's week? Oh, that's fantastic! Alright, so, uh, I have a, another lecture for you this week. This week is a little interesting. We're going to talk about labor. We'll see what I mean there in a minute. Uh, make sure that you're taking notes while you do this, as always. And you respond to the discussion board post after the lecture. Yes, correct. All right. So here we go. Industrialization and the rise of organized labor. Labor, labor. So, the conditions of labor. One important factor behind America's astonishing economic growth in the late 19th century that we talked about last week was the increasing exploitation of its industrial workforce. Pictured here, hard-working Americans with big mustaches and dirty hands. The average, so basically, long story short, is working in a factory was terrible. Uh, the average work day and work week by today's standards was like 10 to 14 hours a, a day for like six days a week. And if you were really unfortunate, seven days a week. Employers hired the least expensive labor they could find. Children, if that was the case, pay average from three to twelve dollars a week. It's sound. It, uh, yes, it is as bad as it sounds. Uh, though immigrants were often willing to work for far less. I mean, the Irish out there in the canal, they literally paid like a quarter and beer every day. Like a quarter, as in the the the, the coin and beer. Though immigrants were often, as I said, oh yeah, women and children were employed often too as low paid workers. Um, as factories or workplaces grew, larger jobs were often offered as a take-it-or-leave-it basis. Either you want this job and we're going to pay you pennies, or you don't want to work at all and make nothing. As industrialists sought greater speed and efficiency, workers became nothing more than a human cog in a machine. Like these lovely fellows, look how happy he is. Oh, doesn't he look happy? Look at his face. He knows he's being taken a picture. Work became less skilled and repetitive and boring. Yes, they did. He, this man here, woke up and for seven days a week did the same thing every day. Made a eight, ten hours a day. He's miserable. Anyways, industrial work conditions were often hazardous. Safeguards around machinery were inadequate. I mean, people lost fingers and limbs and hands. Basically, this guy here would lose his hand and sticking it in one of these parts and get chopped right off. All right, thousands of workers were maimed and lost eyes and teeth and toes every day, all year long. Super dangerous. People died working in these factories. Uh, child labor. Yeah, yeah, we have child labor laws now. But uh, back then, there weren't any child labor laws. If you were six years old and could pull the lever, you could work. Uh, machinery was rarely fenced off, and children were exposed to moving parts of the machines as they worked. Children might be used, actually, to move and clean machines because they were actually small enough to fit between the parts, which large-bodied people were not. About one-fifth of all Americans were working outside the home in 1910. 25% of you would not be in school. You would be these children right here working in the coal mine. These children missed out on, of course, the sunshine, fresh air, and chance to improve your lives that all of you are entitled to now through school. Aren't you glad you go to school? So also there's a lack of job security. Workers could be fired at any time for absolutely no good reason. Since most work was unskilled, workers could be easily replaced. Literally anyone can do your job. Employers dictated pay and working conditions, and they didn't give a hoot what you thought. In bad times during economic slowdowns, ma manufacturers simply hired production, fired you all, or didn't pay you. Uh, workers lacked any benefits enjoyed by factory workers today. There was no time off, no unemployment insurance, no sick leave, no vacation, no compensation for injuries. Basically, you went there, you made pennies, you went home, and you didn't expect anything else from your job. So, obviously, since everything I described to you is absolutely, putridly terrible, it's no wonder that this gives rise to a moment in American history called organized labor, which also coincides with our transformation from an agrarian to an industrialized nation. More people, less people are working in the farms, more people are working in these terrible factories. As a result of these terrible conditions, some groups of workers formed what are known as labor unions to protect their rights. Workers formed unions to act as a large group, which they felt provided them with more power 
than acting as individuals. They sought to address some of the issues I just talked about. Protested, here are some protesters protesting how terrible their job is. So, in 1869, there was a group of random people that formed the Knights of Labor, which created as a single national union for skilled and unskilled labor. The Knights demanded an eight-hour workday, higher wages, and safety codes in factories. They opposed child labor and supported equal pay for women. Woo! All this sounds actually great and reasonable, but nobody wanted to give it to them. No, but I mean nobody. It started by this guy. You'd think his mustache would have convinced them all, but somehow he failed. Um, under, the, under the leadership of a man, this guy named Terrence Powderly, it looks like he powdered his mustache, uh, the organization grew and also collapsed. So in some ways, he does not earn the mustache he wears. Uh -huh. Anyways. Wealthy industrialists like Andrew R. Carnegie used immigrant workers or were closed factories rather than negotiate with these unions. In 1892, striking union members and, uh, and, a, and hired a company, they hired a company of security forces, I'm sorry, and hired company security forces, fought against each other at Carnegie's Homestead Steel Plant. What I mean by hired security, uh, company security, I mean these industrialists like Carnegie and Rockefeller and Vanderbilt had their own small armies that forced the worker to get back into line. What a great boss! The Homestead Strike of 1892 inspired other union workers, though. But it also underscored just how terribly hard all this sounds to actually change anything. These guys have miserable lives and no one's paying attention to them. And this is a lot of America, by the way. The Carnegie Steel Company was successfully able to put down the strike, essentially. Unions were reduced to a minor factor in steel mills throughout the Pittsburgh area. Another reason to never root for the Steelers, the Pirates, the Penguins, or the Flyers. Or this Philadelphia. That's Philadelphia. Never mind. They're okay. Here we go! The American Railway Union was founded in 1893. They, too, led a movement to make their lives better by a man named Eugene V. Debs, a socialist. They welcomed railroad workers, except for those above the rank of foremen. And in 1894, a boycott by the Union against the Pullman Company led to a strike against the rails. The strike soon turned violent, and President Cleveland, yes, the President of the United States, sent in the army to um, break up the strike. They shot at them. Not a good moment in American history. But interesting, I mean, Grover Cleveland, man. Grover Cleveland was the only president to serve two non-consecutive terms. If you don't know what I mean by that, read more about Grover Cleveland. What a great name. His actual name is Stephen, but Stephen Cleveland doesn't get you elected as well as Grover Cleveland. Okay, so workers seeking a national voice. At this railroad strike, 26 civilians were killed, as I mentioned. Debs was arrested and jailed, and soon after, the railroad union totally fell apart. Uh, there was also the American Federation of Labor. was founded by Samuel Gompers. What a name. My goodness, Gompers. The AFL limited membership to skilled workers such as carpenters and cigar makers. They saw higher pay, eight-hour workday, better working conditions. Now, the industrial workers, or the IWW, was established in 1905 by a group of post by the AFL. They organized unskilled factory workers, farm workers, miners, and loggers, and they were, were also, loggers were also heavily represented. They welcomed all kinds of people, including women, ladies! Yes, you too can join a union. In 1886, a labor protest rally near Chicago turned into a riot after someone threw a bomb at the police. Who thought that was a good idea? I mean, come on. You're going to throw a bomb at all the guys with guns? What do you think is going to happen? Anyway, seven policemen were killed and 67 others wounded. Labor leaders were quickly blamed for the Haymarket riot, and it became a major setback for organized labor. The government became convinced that labor unions and strikes were nothing more than terrorists in disguise, and essentially the government turned against unions for a long time. And people like Grover Cleveland just decided we better shoot them. So the incident confirmed to government leaders that businesses needed to be protected. 
and unions, the terrorists, need to be opposed. Business leaders contributed heavily to political campaigns to put down these unions. Moreover, many political politicians shared the same outlook as the business leaders. They saw successful businesses as responsible for American prosperity and saw the unions as greedy, dangerous, disastrous, terrible people. Even though, really, it's the other way around. Moving on. And between 1800 and 19, 1880, I'm sorry, 1900, there were more than 20,000 strikes involving 6 million people. Union activities were closely associated with violence and radicalism. And the U.S. Supreme Court actually temporarily, temporarily ruled that unions were indeed illegal because they had restrained trade. The ruling encouraged government leaders to use more troops to put down the strikes. So, long story short, factory workers work long, terrible, dangerous, horrible hours and are treated like junk by their employers. And give, they give them nothing but pen, pennies on the hour. And then when they protest, complain, assemble about this injustice, they're shot at. That's all I have for you guys today. If you have any questions, please email me at kseriously at spartan.limacityschools.org. Over and out.